This week on Myths and Legends, it's the story of the Jungle Book, where we'll see that basically every animal has a law degree and that school is so much tougher if your teacher is an angry bear. On the Creature of the Week, if you're going to go meet with Malaysian Bigfoot, you'll see why you'll want to bring your fancy cookware. This is Myths and Legends, episode 130A. Welcome to the jungle. This is a podcast where I tell stories from mythology and folklore. Some are incredibly popular stories you think you know, but with surprising origins. Others are stories that might be new to you, but are definitely worth a listen. As I said last week, today's story is neither a myth nor a legend, though it shares many elements with myths and legends. It's been requested countless times for this podcast, and not fictional, so I figured I'd give it a look. And I really liked it. It was my first time reading the original, and I was surprised by its exploration of belonging, isolation, family, and justice, but with talking animals. It comes from a book called, well, The Jungle Book, published in 1894 by English writer Rudyard Kipling. Kipling was born in India, educated in England, and then returned to Bombay at 16 when he couldn't get into Oxford. Of note is the fact that in the text, when the animals of the jungle are referring to themselves and other animals, they use the word people. When referring to humans, they use man. For today's story, we'll stick to calling the animals people, but I'll call the humans humans to avoid the gendered pronoun when it doesn't really apply. So here we go. They were out late, too late, and they knew it. Nervously, the mother gripped her baby. As the father gathered up the bundles of wood, she took one as well, pausing briefly to look into the shadows. Out in the jungle, both parents heard the rustling of thickets. Something was out there, and it was watching them. Then, in an instant, it rushed them, a flash of orange and black bounding from the trees as it pounced right onto the open fire. Both parents gasped in unison, and the father yanked the mother's wrist so hard that she almost fell over. Run. And they did run. The smell of burnt hair filled the air as the creature howled in their wake. It snarled hungrily as it eyed the pair of shapes retreating in the twilight. And it followed. It was slow and purposeful this time. Cautious. The small family ran as fast as it could, gripping their packs and the wood they had cut from their day in the jungle. And then, they were free from the jungle. Fields rippled all around them, and, far off, the light of the village glowed like a beacon. The pair took off once again, and as they ran, the father looked back once more. The eyes that had watched them from the grass, and the orange that glowed in the last light of day sunk back into the darkness of the jungle at twilight. The father let out a giant sigh. They had made it. They were safe. Then the mother heard it. A baby's cry except it hadn't come from within the packs on her chest, tucked safely by her heart. But from the jungle behind them, the mother stopped running and froze. She didn't want to look down. She didn't want it to be true. But it was true. Fluttering at her chest was the cloth she had been using as a sling. It was empty, still warm from when it held her son, the son she had dropped when her husband pulled her arm. So she turned and she ran again. Her husband, who had just realized that she wasn't with him, had to tackle her to the ground to keep her from going back into the jungle. Inside, the crying had ceased. The tiger had obviously heard it, and the boy was surely dead. The only thing to be gained from going back and confirming it was the same ending. Tears streaked her cheeks. The mother knew it to be true. Her boy was gone. humans. They didn't eat humans. They told themselves it was for sport. The human was the weakest, most defenseless of all living things. That's what they told themselves. The truth, however, was that human killing made for problems. Kill too many of them, and more entered the jungle, on their elephants, with their guns. More would walk behind them with torches and drums. Then, everyone suffered. That 
was why you only killed humans far from your hunting grounds, and then only to show the children how to kill. That was the law of the jungle. It was a law that all obeyed. All but Shere Khan. It wasn't that Shere Khan was stupid. He wasn't, though, as Father Wolf listened, the tiger wasn't having a particularly smart night. The yelp that came from the jungle below meant that he had burned his good legs on some woodcutter's campfire, probably chasing the humans from the jungle. Shere Khan would chase them, but he wouldn't catch them. He had a limp from birth, and the only thing he ever caught was sick cattle. It was known far and wide that Shere Khan was a disease. He believed the law of the jungle didn't apply to him as he moved from place to place, picking off cattle and, when he could, people. Mother Wolf was right. He would hunt here until the village came into the jungle looking for him. They would bring the red flower, and all the wolf cubs would have to run. As their cubs awoke from a long day's rest, there was a rustling at the mouth of their cave. They listened. It wasn't Shere Khan. It was too small. And it was clumsy. Unsteady. It was... a man cub? Mother and Father Wolf padded up to the soft, plump, oblivious little person smiling before them. Mother Wolf looked around at the growing night before motioning to her husband to bring the man cub inside. Somehow managing to grab the skin on the toddler's back with his teeth without breaking the human skin, Father Wolf sat the baby down in the middle of a half a dozen hungry pups. They looked on the thing in amazement. Like, I could kill this thing with my paw, Father Wolf said, moving his paw to press down on the baby's neck. Yeah, don't do that, Mother Wolf insisted as she pulled her mate's paw from the baby. The child just kept smiling. None of the wolves knew what to think of it. None of them had ever seen a man cub so young before. And yet, it was brave. This little naked thing was surrounded by predators that could kill it with a single touch, and yet it continued smiling back. Just then, a noise from the mouth of the cave caught everyone's attention. The jackal was back. And this time, he brought his master. Father Wolf bowed low with a snarl, saying that Shere Khan did them a great honor. What did the tiger need? Shere Khan's face alone filled the mouth of the cave. His yellow eyes studied the cave until it lingered on the man-cub. There, that thing, his quarry. He was hunting the man-cub. Its parents had run off and abandoned it. He looked up at the wolves and ordered them to hand it over. Father Wolf cocked his head. Did, did people generally hunt babies? I mean, more so than just walking slowly in the direction of the often loud and plump snack. Either way, Father Wolf shook his head. Nah, the wolves were free people, and they took orders from the head of the pack, which, hold on, Father Wolf held up a paw and checked his imaginary notes. Yep, wasn't Shere Khan, so no. No, they weren't going to be giving up any man cubs. They'd keep it. Or kill it. Really, it looked super delicious and, frankly, was very easy to kill. Father Wolf was actually surprised that Shere Khan had so much trouble with it. That was when the tiger roared. He might have had a leg that slowed him down. He might have burned his paws that night and been easily outwitted by a baby, but he was still a tiger. His roar filled the cave with thunder and it silenced Father Wolf. But it didn't silence Mother Wolf. In her younger days, she had gone by the name of Raksha, the demon, and motherhood had only hardened her. Shere Khan was stuffed into the mouth of the cave. He was as far in as he could go, unable to even swing his paws. The look of Mother Wolf's eyes made him back up. She barked with each step that the man-cub would live. They would raise him, and he would run with the pack. And, when the time came, he would hunt Shere Khan. Mother Wolf continued, staring at the tiger head-on. She didn't hunt sick cows. And if Shere Khan didn't want to limp out of here on another one of his feet, then he should get out of her house. Now. Shere Khan was outside, free of the cave, when he spoke back, yelling that the wolves were thieves. The baby belonged to him, and it would meet its end by the tiger's teeth. Mother Wolf stepped aside, inviting Shere Khan to come inside and take the baby back. But he didn't dare. Shere Khan sneered and limped off into the darkness his jackal friend following closely behind. Father Wolf sat mouth agape. Uh, two things. One, thanks for handling that. Wow. And two, we're keeping him then? I 
represent Mowgli the Frog, Mother Wolf cried out at the pack meeting. Everyone fell silent. He was called Mowgli because that was the name for man cub. And frog because, being plump and relatively hairless, he kind of looked like a frog. In the law of the jungle, the wolves had rights to raise their cubs in their own way. They had to present any new cubs to the pack council. But no one was allowed to kill a cub before it brought down its first buck. After that, I guess they could kill each other whenever they wanted. As it turns out, the law of the jungle is slightly less violent than Viking law. The pack meeting took place on Council Rock, a hilltop covered with stones and boulders. Only wolves and their very special guests were allowed to speak. The voice that boomed out from the shadows, that of Shere Khan, was not allowed to speak. To his credit, I guess, he was tenacious. He wanted to eat that baby. Fear hadn't worked, so maybe legal precedent would? He began citing the laws of the jungle, laws that he actively ignored, saying that he had a right to bring up his dispute before the pack. And when Mother and Father Wolf tried to speak in Mowgli's defense, Shere Khan held up a paw. The law dictated that Mowgli had to be defended by two creatures who were not his parents. Mother and Father Wolf adopted the delicious little appetizer, didn't they? Huh, too bad. Was there anyone else who wanted to speak up for the man-cub? Akela, the leader of all the packs, looked around. He himself had been caught in the traps of man, twice, and he had been beaten and left for dead. He knew human nature, and the pack could read the reticence on his face. None of the wolves would speak for the man-cub. Shere Khan shrugged and started to move forward toward his prize when a voice spoke up from the back. It was a bear. Hey, hold up, a man's cub? Sorry, I was asleep. Yeah, I'll speak for the man's cub, he said before taking a seat. He was the only non-wolf allowed to attend the meetings because he taught all the younger wolves the law of the jungle. He openly admitted to having no gift of intelligence or words, despite that being the only reason the wolves kept him around, but he said he'd teach the man-cub. The man-cub should be allowed to run with the other cubs. Akela, the leader of the pack, shrugged. Okay, that was one. Who would speak for this kid other than Baloo? Silence followed, but then, from the shadows, came a soft padding. Someone had been there the entire time, and the wolves despite their excellent hearing and sense of smell, had missed him completely. It was Bagheera, the Black Panther. The wolves all backed away from Bagheera as he walked toward the assembly. He had no right to be here, he understood. But the law did state that if there was an open case concerning the fate of a cub, unrelated to killing, of course, then the life of the cub in question might be bought, without stipulation of who could pay the price. Correct? McKellen nodded slowly. Yeah, he could see where this was going. Bagheera, the Black Panther, circled back toward the gathered group and continued. Did they really want to kill a naked cub? That would be shameful, would it not? Why not wait until he became old enough to be a challenge? Humans were wise, and they would make good sport for the wolves after he brought down his first buck. Bagheera turned to Akela. There was a fresh fat bull that he had killed not a half mile away. He would add it to Baloo's word, on the condition that the man could be brought up among the wolves. Deal? The wolves, who were excited about eating the baby, were instantly way more excited about the fat bull. The packs and attendants barked. Why not take the man cub? What harm could he do? He'd die in the first winter anyway. So Mowgli was accepted by the wolves as one of their own. Father Wolf picked Mowgli up by his skin and carried him home. Though the packs had spoken, it wasn't truly safe for Mowgli. Not yet. Shere Khan roared and limped off angrily into the night. And Akela stood alone, save for the shadow of the cat, slinking over to his side. He mused aloud. Men and their cubs were wise. The man cub might be of help in time. In a time of need, Bagheera rejoined. No one can hope to lead a pack forever. Akela, the strongest of the wolves, was left alone, staring out into the darkness. We'll see how Mowgli's life in the jungle, which started with several animals fighting over eating him, gets somehow more dangerous. But that will be right after this. 
This week's episode is brought to you by Omaha Steaks. You can send the holiday gift that families across America have loved for over 100 years, Omaha Steaks. Right now, Omaha Steaks is giving an amazing limited time offer to my listeners. When you go to omahasteaks.com and enter the code LEGENDS into the search bar, you'll get 74% off Omaha Steaks family gift package. It's originally $195, now only $49.99. If you order now, you'll get four hand-cut top sirloin steaks, two savory premium pork chops, four chicken fried steaks, four Omaha steak burgers, four snappy kielbasa sausages, all beef meatballs, four potatoes au gratin, four caramel apple tartlets, plus get four more burgers for free. Omaha Steaks is a fifth-generation family-owned company with over 100 years of experience delivering perfectly aged beef, hand-cut by master butchers in Omaha. It sounds like the perfect holiday gift. Your friends and family don't even have to know you heard this. You can pretend it's a $200 gift. They don't have to know it was only $49.99. Don't wait. This offer ends soon. Go to omahasteaks.com and type legends in the search bar to send the Omaha Steaks family gift package today. It's that time of year when everyone's coming up with thoughtful gifts. So why not give a loved one, or yourself, the gift of an Audible membership? Now's the best time to do it with a special offer. Access an unbeatable selection of audiobooks. It's simple. Choose three titles every month, one audiobook and two Audible originals that you can't hear anywhere else. Then, listen on any device, anywhere, at home, at the gym, on your commute, or just on the go. There are easy audiobook exchanges, rollover credits, and an audiobook library you keep forever, even if you cancel. Since I read a ton for this podcast, audiobooks are so nice. I'm currently getting into Ron Chernow's Alexander Hamilton bit by bit. Like, when I'm in the car, when I'm working out, if I take a walk, it's nice that it goes anywhere. Right now, for a limited time, you can get three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. That's more than half off the regular price. Give yourself the gift of listening. And while you're at it, think about giving the gift of Audible to someone on your list. For more, go to audible.com slash myths or text myths to 500-500. That's A-U-D i-b-l-e dot com slash myths or text myths to 500 500 all right now back to the show again baloo told the seven-year-old man cub in front of him mowgli rolled his eyes seriously he had said every call a hundred times. Again, Baloo demanded. Mowgli groaned. Weren't bears supposed to be fun and relaxed and make puns and songs about life? Baloo shook his head. Where did Mowgli hear that? Where was that remotely a thing regarding bears? Baloo slapped Mowgli square across the face with his paw. Now, say them again. Mowgli was learning the stranger's hunting call. It was a call in every language of the jungle that said, quote, Give me leave to hunt here because I am hungry. The reply was, Hunt then, for food, but not for pleasure. Mowgli had said every call and response a hundred times, but Baloo won him 101. A few hours later, Bagheera stopped by to see how Mowgli was doing. He looked at Mowgli's cheeks and shook his head. He turned to Baloo. The man cub was still small. He could only fit so much in his head. Baloo shouldn't push the boy so far. The sober and serious bear asked the panther if there was anything in the jungle that was too small to be killed. That was the reason for the relentless drilling of the law of the jungle. And that was the reason for the bruises. Better he be bruised and beaten head to foot by someone who was trying to teach him something than be killed out there on account of ignorance. Mowgli concluded his latest review of the stranger's hunting call in all the languages of the jungle, and Baloo smiled at last. There. Now no one was to be feared. Bagheera sighed. No one except his own tribe. Mowgli had heard all this before, all the warnings that we'll talk about next week. And he thought they were stupid. Besides, he said he'd soon have a tribe of his own, and he'd lead them through the branches all day long. Both Bagheera and Baloo froze. What did Mowgli just say? The boy shrugged. Yeah, he'd swing all day in the trees and throw branches and dirt at old Baloo. They promised him. Bagheera gasped, but Baloo roared. With the swipe of his paw, he knocked Mowgli down from the tree and pinned him to the ground. How long had Mowgli been talking to them? Mowgli's eyes darted to Bagheera for help, but the Black Panther looked on with just as much fury as Baloo. You've been talking to the Banderlog, the monkeys. How long? 
Blue demanded again, before slapping Mowgli across the face. Mowgli could see his tutor, though he had never seriously hurt the boy, wasn't joking. He quickly told him everything. The banderlog, the gray apes, had come to him one morning, after a particularly rough lesson with Blue, where he was left with more bruises on his face than regular skin. They took him to the tops of the trees, where they said that Mowgli was their blood brother, even though he didn't have a tail. They told him that one day he would be their leader. Baloo face pawed. The monkeys didn't have law. They ate everything. They lied. They had always lied. Mowgli shrugged. But they were kind to him, and they asked him to come up to the trees again. Then Mowgli looked at Baloo. Wait, of all the hundreds of languages Baloo drilled into him each day, why hadn't he learned the languages of the monkeys? They stood on their back feet as Mowgli did and they didn't hit him. You know what? Maybe the next time they came around, he would take them up on their offer. Mowgli had been learning under Baloo for years now, and though he occasionally feared the bear, he had never been truly, profoundly afraid. Until now. He pinned Mowgli to the ground, and he roared. He told Mowgli that he had taught the man-cub the law of the jungle for all the people of the jungle, except for the monkey folk who lived in the trees. They had no language. No law, no leaders, no remembrance. They might get an idea in their mind, but in the next instant, their thoughts turned to laughter. The people of the jungle had no dealings with them. They didn't drink where they drank, go where they went, or die where they died. The jungle people put them out of their minds. Truly, the monkey people were forbidden to the jungle people. Don't ever forget that, Baloo declared. The paw pinning Mowgli to the ground relaxed at last and the man-cub could see that Bagheera was just as serious as his tutor. Mowgli hung his head. He didn't know about the monkeys. He wouldn't speak to them again. Quickly, he apologized to Baloo and Bagheera, and the bear smiled, offering Mowgli a paw and helping the boy to his feet. Making mistakes was all part of learning, they told the boy. But Mowgli should have really told them about the monkeys. With a nod, the three started their walk back to the wolf pack. Mowgli now lay resting far away from his two protectors. He was still feeling ashamed about the monkey incident, and even though Baloo and Bagheera assured him that it was fine, he just felt so stupid. There was still so much about this place he didn't know. He had never thought about it when he was a boy, but as he grew from a man-cub to a man, the differences became clearer. Maybe that was why he liked the monkeys. For the first time in his life, he had someone that looked like him. Granted, it was in the broadest strokes possible, but maybe it filled a need that he never knew he had. But everyone said that they were foolish, horrible little creatures. And so what did that say about him? From the stories he had heard about mankind, the ones who lived beyond the jungle, like the monkeys, they enjoyed wanton destruction. It was said that man was smart and cruel. As Mowgli rested in the cool shade of the tree, he wondered who he was in all this. With a sigh, he remembered his family. He also had friends. He would go rejoin them. Blue and Bagheera thought him worthy of their friendship and time. And so he would make himself worthy of it. That's when he heard a, hey, from behind him. Mowgli spun around, but no one was there. It all happened so quickly after that. A gray blur passed over his eyes, and when he tried to cry out, he found himself biting down on a vine. Someone had gagged him, and all he could hear was laughing from the trees. Taking advantage of his confusion, the monkeys took out his feet. From the moment he hit the ground, three more were on him, binding his hands and looping the vines around his feet. For creatures that could barely keep a thought in their heads for ten minutes, the abduction went off without a hitch. In seconds from when he heard the whisper behind him, Mowgli found himself hoisted up into the trees, heading off toward the Forbidden City. It went off without a hitch, that is except for the laughing. Neither Baloo nor Bagheera knew that, from the trees, as Baloo was berating Mowgli, dozens of little eyes watched them from the shadows. Knowing that the man-cub wouldn't be persuaded now, the hate of the jungle people had infected him. So when they kidnapped the boy, they laughed. They laughed because the stupid bear, for all of his words and learning, couldn't do anything to stop them. He couldn't climb the trees to come after them, not as fast as them, at least. 
his impotent roars would fill the jungle, and they would just laugh all the more. They continued laughing, even as Bagheera clawed at the trees, snarling in his attempts to go after them. Panting, the panther arrived at the top of the tree, just in time to watch the gagged and wide-eyed Mowgli vanish beneath the canopy. Mowgli bounced hard with the monkeys from branch to branch as the creature swung into a part of the jungle he had never seen before. For all the terror of being kidnapped, Mowgli was still a seven-year-old, and this was about as close as he would ever get to a roller coaster, so it was kind of cool. Dipping down into the forest, he caught a flutter of wings. It was a kite, a bird. Mowgli had chewed through the gag, though none of the monkeys seemed to care. Mowgli racked his brain, remembering the language of the kite, and called out. The bird hovered near to the group of monkeys. Mowgli yelled that he didn't have much time. Please, his name was Mowgli the Man Cub. Mark his trail, Tubaloo of the CNE Pack, and Bagheera of Council Rock. The kite called back in the affirmative and flapped high up in the trees to watch how they shuddered as the monkeys bounded from branch to branch. As he thudded along, an incessant cacophony of laughter boring into his brain, Mowgli begrudgingly admitted that Baloo was right. It was good that he had practiced the languages. It wasn't every day that Bagheera met an animal who could kill him so quickly and thoroughly, who could enthrall him with a glance, crush his bones, and leave him to slowly digest in his stomach. Bagheera didn't like seeking out Ka the rock snake, but he went anyway. The massive python lay sunning himself on the rocks, and clearly, he hadn't eaten. You could always tell when he had eaten. Bagheera heard that Ka wasn't the venomous type. He actually hated venomous snakes, the rumors went. It was a cowardly way to kill. Ka's dangers came from his hugs. He squeezed. He squeezed and squeezed until the small things and the large things broke and could easily slide down his throat. But Ka the snake was apparently the only thing the monkeys feared. He could climb up to their little city high in the trees. And he did, every now and then, when he wanted a snack, taking a baby monkey before slithering back down into the jungle. When the bear and the panther approached, the python reared up and slid over to them, asking Baloo and Bagheera how their hunting was. Baloo apologized for disturbing the snake. They just passed this way hunting monkeys. Did Ka like monkeys? They seem to have said something as they passed by here. What was it, Bagheera? A uh, footless yellow earthworm, Bagheera replied. Bagheera was as brave as he was smart. As Ka stared him down, he reminded himself that he was doing this for Mowgli. Yeah, they said not to worry because the snake had lost all his teeth. He couldn't handle any more than a baby goat now. Anger rippled through Ka as the snake brought himself up to full height. He would be joining Baloo and Bagheera on their hunt. Neither animal objected. But first... Ka wanted to know why. Why were two leaders of the jungle interested in the banderlog, the monkeys? It was a point of pride to never be interested in them, right? Bagheera hung his head. The truth? The truth was that the banderlog had taken their cub. He was a man cub. He was their pupil. And they loved the weird little frog thing. Ka's head swayed back and forth at the mention of a man cub. Hmm. That wasn't good. The Banderlog would get it in their mind to do something great with the stick they found, but then they'd forget and snap it in two by the time they reached home. Or they'd be out picking nuts, and then just drop them from the treetops for fun. If the boy wasn't dead from being dropped on the jungle floor, Ka hoped they untied him at least. They were just as likely to let him starve, forgotten in a corner, as they were to make him their king. Just then, they heard a cry from the trees. The kite, the same one that had talked to Mowgli, flapped low. He eyed Ka warily, but screeched a word to Baloo, asking him if he was the Baloo of the Sioni pack. If so, the kite had a message for him. Baloo, Bagheera, and Ka raced toward the cold lairs, the lost city. Of course the Vanderlog would be there. According to the kite, the place was infested with them. It looked like they were living there as much as they lived anywhere. 
They were capricious and changeable, always shifting and moving and flitting from place to place based on their fears or appetites. The cold lairs used to be a human city in the heart of the jungle, but it was abandoned years ago. The jungle people, the animals, avoided the homes of humans, even those long left destitute. The predators raced toward the cold lairs. Even during the heat of the day, there was no telling how long the banderlog would stay, or, if they did, how long Mowgli would live. Meanwhile, in the lost city, Mowgli rolled on the cold marble floor. He knew this place had been built by humans, but he didn't know how anyone could have lived there. Outside, the banderlog sang, saying that it was foolish for him to want to leave. They were free. They were great. They were the most wonderful people in the jungle. They all said it, so it must be true. It was obvious from the start. Baloo was right. The monkeys were unpredictable. They couldn't keep a thought in their head for ten minutes. And when they untied Mowgli, they asked him to teach them how to weave leaves together to make a roof to keep the rain off their heads. They lost focus about halfway through and ended up hitting each other with the leaves. When Mowgli complained that he was hungry, a group left and went into the jungle to get him some nuts. That had been three hours ago, and Mowgli had just now heard them laughing about something completely unrelated below. With a roll of his eyes, Mowgli started exploring the city around him. He made it as far as the western wall before the monkeys found him. As he put a hand on the wall to climb, more and more monkeys came from inside the stone houses. Then, Mowgli remembered what Baloo had said, how the monkeys ate anything. Mowgli slowly came down from the wall. At this point, Mowgli sat trying to get what rest he could as the day turned into night. But the city of ruins was cold, and the banderlog were loud, and, huh, they'd stop singing. The shrieks and the dozens of banderlog that stormed the hall in which he had been sleeping exploded into his awareness simultaneously as he was swept up in a wave of tiny, hairy hands. Seconds later, he recognized a roar from the courtyard. Bagheera. A smile blossomed on the boy's face. He tried to fight against the swarm of banderlog, but he was too late. The monkeys found a hole in the wide, domed roof of the stone summer house on the edge of the city, and they pushed Mowgli through it. If Mowgli hadn't been trained in the jungle, he would have broken something in the two-story fall to the floor of that summer house. One of the monkeys called out from above for him to stay there until they killed his friends. Later, they would play some more. You know, if the poison people left Mowgli alive. Mowgli cocked an eyebrow. Poison people? He knew all the people of the jungle. Who were the poison people? That was when, in the last light of the day, Mowgli saw the eyes popping open in the surrounding darkness. Dozens of them, all slithering toward him. Oh, poison people, Mowgli thought as he stepped back, feeling the hard marble on the wall. Cobras. Fantastic. I guess this is the opposite of a cliffhanger, because he's not on a cliff, but in a pit of venomous snakes while his friends are being torn apart by monkeys outside. But don't worry, we'll catch up with Mowgli next week as we continue the story of the Jungle Book. Real quickly, I just want to mention that we have an online shop where you can get awesome t-shirts, stickers, and more, all while helping to support the show. For the shop, head on over to shop.bardic.fm. There's also a membership thing on the site. For less than the price of a pet monkey that you can buy online and get shipped to your house, though you really shouldn't, there are extra episodes, source back ebooks, and ad-free versions of the show that won't band together and throw you into a pit of cobras. Check out support.mythpodcast.com for more info on the membership. The creature this week is the Kakibisar from Malaysia. The Kakibisar is the Malaysian Bigfoot. It's a nine-foot-tall humanoid creature that haunts the forests of Johor in Malaysia. And frankly, it is way worse than Bigfoot. Bigfoot is just a shy hominid who is apparently overly fond of beef jerky. But the Kakibisar? The Kakibisar will slice you in half with a flick of its wrist. Both potential origin stories for this creature are equally likely. There's a thought that the nine-foot-tall creature with 18-inch-long feet 
and two foot long claws on each hand that can slice through bone as easily as skin is an offshoot in the evolutionary process somewhere down the line. They're like Cro-Magnon Man, if he also had two foot long claws and ruining your camping trips. The other origin story is that they were put on Earth by demons to harass and hunt us all. Apparently there's still a very widespread belief in this creature, since I found a news report of a widespread hunt for a Kakibasar as recent as 2005. I put a link in the show notes if you want to read it. If you find yourself on a Kakibasar hunt, first, I'm very sorry, but there are some ways to keep the Kakibasar away from you. The first is to build a fire. Like absolutely everyone who has sat around a fire ever, the Kakibasar hates getting a face full of smoke and will do anything to avoid it. The second way, cookware. The creature may be a terrifying human evolutionary ancestor whose brethren have been on the earth for millennia, or a creature created by the dark forces of this world to wreak havoc on us all, but it apparently hates the clanging of pots and pans. So, if you find yourself in Malaysian forests, be sure to bring your pots and pans and clang them together to scare off the Kaki Basar, but try not to get eaten after you inadvertently attract a tiger. That's it for this week. The theme song is by the band Broke for Free, and the Creature of the Week music is by Steve Combs. There are links to even more music in the show notes. Today's episode was written by me, Jason Weiser. Our story editor was Carissa Weiser. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>